Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipperer, the club's vice president of media and editorial and Michelle's co-host for this program. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Commonwealth Club of California is a 118-year-old nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to the civil discussion of important issues of the day and any opinions expressed are those of the speakers. Now we're producing hundreds of programs a year, even during the pandemic. So you can head over to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS for all of our upcoming programs, as well as podcasts and video from past events. And if you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box to submit questions and we'll work some of them into our, question, our conversation with our special guest today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miao. She's the producer and host of the Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Good to see you again, Michelle. Thank you so much, John, and thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon. The Michelle Miao Show is your A through Z covering the LGBT, LMNOP, and everyone in between. Our special program guest this afternoon is Dr. Paula Stone Williams, a Christian pastor, counselor, speaker, LGBTQIA plus ambassador, and I heard before this program, therapist, a gender equity advocate, and the author of As a Woman. Thank you so much, Paula, for joining us this afternoon. Oh, it's so good to be with you. I'm so happy to be here. So it's, it's tradition here. Yes, we do share coming out stories from time to time. I mean, I think the entire memoir is exactly that. Um, but there's something that you do say each time you come out, and that is, I've known since I was three or four years old that I am a transgender woman. Let's start there and let's affirm for our audience today, you know, that most transgender people know since a very young age. Yeah, there was no doubt. I know the time frame because of the house we lived in at the time, which we did not move to until I was three and we left when I was five. So I know it was somewhere in that time frame that I remember thinking quite consciously, well, it won't be long before the gender fairy arrives. She would be in this blue cerulean blue dress and, and she would say, well, the time, you know, the time has come. Oh, what are you going to be? And I would choose what I knew I wanted to be, which was a girl. And, you know, the, the gender fairy, much to my dismay, did not arrive. And so, yeah, for me, that was, um, you know, I think about it now, that, that itself was white male privilege, you know, that, uh, that I actually would have thought that I got to choose my own gender. It's just uh, probably a very early sign of that. But yeah, I knew it. I knew it as early as, as my earliest uh, memories. You write in the book that people often will say about transgender people that, you know, for example, as you give Paula felt like a girl in a boy's body, but for you, that was not true. So could you talk a bit about that and, and uh, how you felt? No, I never felt like I was a girl in a boy's uh, body. I always felt like I was supposed to have been born a girl. And so the story that I created, this narrative was that, oh, maybe apparently none of us are born specifically gendered. And so that actually is going to happen here shortly before I go to school, certainly. So it was mostly a sense that I just was supposed to have been born a girl. And so once I realized that, no, actually you don't get to choose your gender and was in this fundamentalist family where I clearly was not going to be talking about it, I did not hate being a boy. I just knew I wasn't one. So for me, the childhood experience was really fairly comfortable. It wasn't until I hit puberty that I really began to realize that I was going to have an ongoing problem. The book does begin with chapter one and talks about uh, the night that you got married. And I was curious about that, you know, uh, why you chose to start with the night you got married. And then I understood why later, 
um, in which you're very honest about trying to trying to find a cure, trying to cure yourself. Let's talk about chapter one. Yeah, the truth of the matter is I did not want to start the book there. It's painful to start the book there. That was my editor's idea, and she had to talk me into it. As she went through the narrative, she said, I think we need to establish early on um, exactly where this is going. And so it was difficult. And it was difficult because that was one of the very few things I had not told my former wife. And Kathy and I were married for 40 years. We're still in business together. We're both therapists. And so when I had written that section, she's been through every tiny part of the book and approved every bit of it. But when I went through that section, I had to say, you know, this is something I didn't ever tell you uh, because I thought it was going to be um, too painful. And, uh, and then I had, of course, go back and say, it's actually going to start the book. But that actually ended up being very cathartic uh, for the two of us. It's caused us to have a conversation even in the last week where I found out how she felt on that very first day in ways I had never known before that are um, really emotionally rocking my world right now, but ultimately I think are going to be very good for both of us uh, and our friendship. Well, you kind of just used the word I was going to ask if writing the book, and I mean, it, when people read the book, the, there are a number of, of, of stories from your life that are related that, that are just very painful and emotional. So I was going to ask, was writing it cathartic? You, you might, talked about that kind of with that one incident. So maybe could you do this twofold throughout the book? Was, was that a similar experience for you as well as then now that you're going in and doing these, these, these virtual book tours and we're, you know, all of us are asking you to, to relay it again, this terribly painful moment in your life or when this horrible thing happened, um, is that painful or is it healing to you? You know, if you're going to write a raw memoir, then probably you should expect that a good interviewer is going to ask you questions about your raw memoir. So I think I knew that part was coming. For me, I started earnestly writing after COVID had arrived. And so I was able to really focus a lot of time. My major income is through speaking on issues of gender equity all over the world and working with my church and my clients. I've always been a Renaissance person. But a lot of that slowed down during COVID, so I was able to really focus in on the book. But the hardest time of all was when I went to my editor, probably in uh, maybe late August, early September, and I said, I'll, I'll give you back your advance. I, I, don't, I don't think this is a great book. I, I think it's a good book, but it's, it's not great. And I, I don't know that I have it in me. And she said, you know, you told me a few months ago you wanted to write a great book, not a good one. She said, I've been really tough on you since then. She said, you're close. You're really close. And I wrote for 10 hours a day, 12 hours some days, five to six days a week for the next six weeks. And that, I think, was one of the most exhausting periods of my life. Because that's when I went from... Uh, from telling this story to emoting this story to, you know, I, I always don't, I don't think anybody wants to, you know, D.H. Lawrence has that great line, a writer sheds his sickness in his writing. You don't want to have your book be your unresolved issues. You don't want it to be open wounds. You want to be writing from your scars, not your open wounds. And there were a lot of things I was writing at that point that had just scarred over. So it was, in fact, a very difficult period. And since I started doing the interviews, and, and there have been dozens and dozens of them, all of the interviewers have been um, wonderful. And they also have been probing. And so it's just not always easy, you know? And so, yes, there, there is, um, there's an emotional price you pay. I, I remember talking to Gene Robbins and the, the bishop, the first Episcopal K bishop. And, and I, we were both doing keynotes for an event and, uh, 
I, w- I had only transitioned maybe four years earlier. And he said, Paula, uh, all the attacks um, and all the pain, it accumulates. And so it does, so it does. But to f- finally answer all of your question, it's cathartic. It, it's really cathartic. It is, in fact, healing, even when it's difficult. When I was reading the audio version of the book, I had a wonderful engineer. He's done over 3,000 audio books, and he happens to be local, but he does a lot of Simon & Schuster's uh, books, and um, he was so good with me. I would just break down in tears, and he would say, "We're, we're good. And a number of times, it has stayed. The tears have remained in the audio book. And uh, I think that's probably a good thing. I did also get a chance to watch, um, you know, your path to redemption, the TED talk that you did with your son. And, and that I watched it after I read the book. And there was a part of a lot of things that you said, but just even the way you said it and the way you tell your story between the book and the TED talk in which I felt like, you know, I was sitting in, um, a sermon or I was sitting, you know, listening to a pastor speak. I think your story is so incredibly important coming from even a evangelical Christian perspective and the, and understanding the community, even if you're not Christian, I'd love to hear maybe, um, you know, if, if that part might've been harder to talk about than even talking about being transgender. I actually think that uh, talking about that part to me is um, is important because I believe that the fundamentalist forms of all three desert religions, uh, the Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and their fundamentalist form remain religions of scarcity. And I think they have a very high capacity um, to, to bring um, great pain into the world and not a lot of healing. And I was a part of the evangelical world for a long time. I was powerful within that world. I was comfortable in that world. And I thought I was bringing about change from within. And I realize now that, well, maybe a little bit, but I remained in that world far too long. I do believe ultimately that religion um, is, is helpful, or maybe I should say more specifically, Um, You know, religion is generally for people afraid of going to hell. A spirituality is for people who've already been to hell. And I think spiritual communities are actually a good thing for our species. In fact, that's what first brought us to the point of being a tribal species, took us from the level of blood kin to the level of community. It was man's search for meaning that brought us together, think Stonehenge. And I still think it's good to work out our search for meaning together in community. I just think it's really unfortunate where evangelicalism and fundamentalism, and they have great power in the United States right now, where they have taken that. And so I I like to be a part of the solutions, why I'm still a pastor of, of what is a Christian church, but certainly not a very conservative one. And I, I think it's important for us to try to work out the meaning of life together. And I, I think it's also important for us to call out the damage that evangelicalism has done. There has been some uh, uh, research lately showing that evangelicalism has finally, the, the population identifying as evangelical has finally dipped. And for, for decades, as outsiders would maybe be looking at it and saying, look, there are a lot of folks who are kind of being ruined by Christ, for, about Christianity by very bad experiences in evangelical, and in particular, fundamentalist churches. And, and for all that time, really, a lot of those pastors and, and preachers and, and theologians, et cetera, could say, well, tough, we're growing, we're the future. And who knows what it'll, what it'll be 10 or 20 years from now. But I mean, I'm more getting at, do you see evangelicalism changing, perhaps fundamentally, to use that term, with issues of gender and such. I mean, we, we saw the former editor of Christianity Today who, after he retired, he you know, came out and was saying, he didn't come out, but I mean, he, he wrote that he's in, you know, he supports same-sex uh, marriage and, and LGBT rights and such. But um, 
you know, is that just a very thin layer of folks or do you see maybe that, is there a, 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 an age difference, generational change that uh, could be changing evangelicalism uh, over the next decades? We know the facts on that. Uh, the facts are that only 37% of evangelicals are supportive of marriage equality, but that's up from just 27% just eight years earlier. I was going to say seven percent surprises me. Yeah. And well, that same study tells us that uh, millennial and Gen Z are at 51%. And so I think when you take a look right now, you know, who's driving these uh, awful, awful uh, laws that are pending in all of these various states and have been passed, uh, over a dozen of them have been passed, taking away the civil rights of transgender children. And interestingly, there was a study not long ago, actually at the time of the election that indicated it's not Republicans conservatives who are driving these laws. It's Republican legislatures that are passing them, but it's not conservative Republicans driving these laws. 61% of them believe that transgender people should have the same civil rights as anybody else. So who is driving these laws? 84% of evangelicals believe that gender is immutably determined at birth. 61% believe that our nation has already been too accommodating to transgender people. And yet only 25% of evangelicals know someone who is out as a non-binary or as a transgender person. So that's who's driving it. And what it is, is exactly what you're saying, John. These uh, male leaders and evangelicalism is 100% male-led, they are fighting for their life right now. And this is their last stand and they know it. And so you really see this desperation. And when they lost on marriage equality, they just shifted the playing field to attack transgender people when, you know, any evangelical who's you know been to a Bible college knows that you have no scriptural rational foundation to take an oppositional view to gender dysphoria, which is what being transgender is called in the DSM-5. You know, it, it's like, come on, guys, anybody can can just show you that that's just not biblical. And they always claim they want to be biblical. But, you know, the frightening part is that's still the major religious teaching in 28 states of the United States. You know, I spent 35 of my years in New York. I'm in uh, the Boulder, Colorado area now. But, you know, on the East Coast and where you are, the West Coast, we do not understand the power that evangelicalism has in the central and southern part of our nation. And, you know, I think we see it politically uh, right now and tragically at the same time. You, you're very honest in the book when you did come out to um, the Orchard Group, which is the, the, the nonprofit group that ran the evangelical churches. Um, as you were a leader in, you know, it, it, you also talked about, yes, it, to them, it was like, as a transgender person, like you couldn't be a part of the organization, but there was also this other conversation that was happening and it was around money and funding and where the money was coming from and who was actually funding. And they were so afraid of losing their money. And so as I'm listening to you answer John's question, it's like, if the, if the church becomes much more progressive, where, what about the money part? If that dries up eventually? Yeah. You know, actually the lead pastor of one of the largest churches in the nation said to me shortly before I transitioned, because I had had a much more liberal position on LGBTQ plus issues for a long time. He said, oh, you know, I've already moved on on this issue, but my money hasn't. So that is, in fact, where a lot of these leaders are, particularly the ones who are, you know, 50 and younger. They, they know the world has moved on. They're not stupid. And that's why none of, almost none, shouldn't say none, but I would say 90 to 95% of the 100 largest churches in America will tell you um, that you are welcome there as an LGBTQ plus person. Um, but the truth is not one of them is open and affirming. You know, and I, they know me in a lot of those churches. You can just ask them, would Paula be allowed to preach there? You know, at some point in my past life, I preached in at least three of the 10 largest churches in the U.S. So could Paula preach there? And, it, you know, what you'll get is people trying not to answer the question because the truth is they are not 
not an affirming church. But oh, they go to great lengths at this point trying to tell you uh, that they are. We welcome you here. We welcome you here. Yeah, well, can I lead here? Can I preach here? Can I be on the board here? Oh, well, now, you know. But that's just a sign that they're just playing a game at this point. They're just waiting for a generation to move on. And then finally, you know, there'll be the Johnny come lately that, that says, oh, yeah, we're here. I mean, it's happened on everything else uh, with them, every other subject over the, over the decades. You know, the, the evangelical church was one of the last to come around on recognizing, um, even at rudimentary levels, the racism in America. It took them forever to accept divorce and remarriage in America. So trans, uh, trans um, families, uh, that uh, transracial families in America, you know, all of these things were, were forbidden in evangelical churches until well after they were accepted in society. Um, often when we're talking about like really conservative religious societies, whether it's evangelical Christians or, you know, supposedly strict Muslims in Saudi Arabia, um, one realizes there's more fealty paid to the word of it than the actual practice of it. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who are breaking these supposedly unbreakable rules. Um, in your book, you're right. I mean, unlike so many of those, you adhered to it. You know, you were a virgin on your, your wedding night. So w- when you were a child, were you a fundamentalist or were you just <laughs> repressed? I mean, what, what was your personal religious belief uh, and, and system if you can uh, kind of synopsize it. I was a fundamentalist for sure. So I was terrified of going to hell. You know, that's kind of the focus of fundamentalism is on trying to avoid hell. And so it wasn't until um, high school, I was always, uh, I mean, I'm always asking questions. It's, it's just, I'm just, you know, I'm terminally curious. I, so I would, um, you know, by high school, I had my questions and I, I got a job as a disc jockey at a commercial radio station at 16 because it doesn't everybody. Uh, you know, I just had no idea the kind of privilege I had. But I ended up getting a scholarship offer at um, the University of Kentucky in broadcasting, but I was terrified to take it because I, at that point, was very aware I was transgender. There was nothing out about it. I mean, there were no books. I were rushing home from school to watch Merv Griffin uh, and interview Christine Jorgensen, the first well-known trans person of the 20th century. And so I was terrified of having to deal with it. And I knew if I left evangelicalism, I would have to deal with it. So instead, I took a, st- a scholarship to a Christian university, which I say in the book was probably not my best choice. <laughs> but it was, it was a matter of um, trying to, to control something I was terrified of. In the book, you also share very openly about um, your, your, your insights, you know, transitioning from male to female, but also the impacts of gender inequity, gender inequality in our society, starting with religion. And um, yeah, I mean, I I just learned, sometimes it's so difficult to articulate this when you're reduced to, look, listen, it is much more different and challenging uh, to be a woman, you know, in society. And people sometimes will respond like, you know, give me more, tell me why. And sometimes you just don't have the words, but after reading the book, it's like, I learned, you know, from the churches down to even places that you socialize, you were able to talk about the inequities and inequality. It it was a wake up call. My first uh, TED talk, which is on YouTube, um, and you can also link to it through TED, has had four and a quarter million views, and it's actually on gender equity. And I've heard from women on all seven continents. It's the main subject I speak on um, because I do have a unique perspective. And there is no way a well-educated white male can understand how much the culture is tilted in his favor because it's all he's ever known and all he ever will know. There's no way he can understand that he started life closer to the finish line because he works very hard. He does. But he started life closer to the finish line. And I just didn't know these things, you know, and my, it was a rude awakening because the very first time I flew as Paula, I had only 
only been out for a couple of weeks. And I, I get to my seat on the plane and there's stuff in my seat and I pick it up and a guy says, that's my stuff. And I'm putting my stuff down and I'm holding his stuff. And I said, well, you know, I'll hold it till you find your seat. He said, lady, that's my seat. And I said, actually, it's not. It's my seat, 1D. But I'll hold your stuff till you find your seat. And he said, I, what do I have to tell you? That is my seat. And I said, yeah, actually, it's not. It's my seat. But like, and which point the guy behind me said, lady, would you take your effing argument elsewhere so I can get on the plane? I was stunned. I had never been treated like that. I can tell you exactly what happened for four decades. I would have said, excuse me, I believe that's my seat. And immediately the guy would have looked at his boarding pass because a powerful white man would have been saying, I believe that's my seat. And his immediate thought would have been, huh, he might be right. He would have looked at the boarding pass. Instead, nope, not until a flight attendant came. And then she takes the boarding pass and says to him, sir, you're in 1C. She's in 1D. I put his stuff down there. You know, he doesn't apologize. And then Mr. Take Your Effing Argument Elsewhere is next to me in 1F. And, and yes, you know, uh, I've flown over two and a half million miles with Americans, so I always have the free upgrades. So I am still very aware of my continuing privilege. Um, but, you know, my friend Karen came on the plane to, to give the paperwork to the captain and she sees me there and she, she waves goodbye as she leaves. And she called me when we got into Charlotte and she said, Paula, what happened? And I told her and she said, yeah, you were as white as a sheep. She said, but oh, my dear, I'm so sorry. Welcome to the world of women. And that was, in fact, my very rude wake-up call. And for me, the, the entire traveling, uh, staying at hotels, flying, that experience to me is where I see it the most, because that's the one experience that is precisely the same as it was previously. So, you know, if you're executive platinum with American, you're executive platinum with American, r regardless of what your gender is. But, you know, we, we were in... Tucson, and they downgraded the equipment from a CRJ-700 to a CRJ-200. A 200 is actually a clown car masquerading as an airliner. So, you know, they call me up to the, to the front, and he said, I, I put you in the exit row since there's no first class. I said, well, thanks, but um, actually on a, on a 200, you know, row one, 1A one or 1F, they actually have the most room, you know, because the exit row doesn't even have any more leg room. With great condescension, dripping, he said, well, ma'am, I can put you in row one, but the exit row is the exit row. You know, and I didn't say anything because, it's, you know, I learned real quickly, if you do, well, now you're just that woman. But I also know exactly what would have happened when that happened when I was a guy, because it would happen. And, and this happened all the time. I would say something like that. And the gate agent would say, oh, you frequent flyers know everything. Because yes, we frequent flyers know everything. But you know, that is just an ongoing issue, uh, flying, uh, renting a car at a hotel. It's constant and it is aggravating. A, a big problem certainly is, is going to be with folks who never been around women in positions of power. I've never had women preaching, never had a female boss. Their mother maybe wasn't out in the business world or whatever. Um, when I was growing up a kid in the 70s, I mean, I'm a United Methodist. I mean, we had, our bishop was a woman. Uh, you know, my stepmother became a pastor and is now a retired pastor. Um, I kind of specifically on evangelicalism, how different do you think it could be? Could it still be, you know, uh, what it claims to be, you know, biblically uh, uh, based and all that. Do you think, it, how different do you think it would be if it had women pastors and, and others um, in top leadership positions and top teaching positions? Yeah, unfortunately, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, we're dealing with a pure patriarchy. And you know, Rene Girard was the anthropologist and a philosopher who uh, I think coined the term mimetic theory, but, you know, talked about when, when people get in power, they're not inclined to give up that power. And so what they do is create enemies within the camp. And so those enemies within the camp, they tell the camp that, well, 
I'm the only one actually with the capacity to see who these enemies are and root them out. So you, you can't let me out of power because I, I'm the only one who can actually recognize it. And, you know, it ought to be kind of suspicious if you take a look at evangelicalism specifically, but you would see the same thing in conservative Islam and in uh, some parts of conservative, conservative Judaism. Um, it just seems interesting to me that, um, oh, yeah, they have concerns about social issues. But what social issues have they decided to be concerned about? Um, uh, it's a woman's right to choose and LGBTQ plus issues. So now if you are this purely patriarchal world, which is also true of the Catholic church, and uh, you wanna maintain your power, uh, what social issues could you choose that would actually personally cost you nothing? Um, oh, hey, hey, how about a, a woman's right to choose because none of us are women? And uh, yeah, LGBTQ plus issues because hey, that's only like, you know, three to 5% of us. So they can use those as their major social issues and tell their people how on those two issues, the world is being taken away from you. And that costs them nothing. On the other hand, should they focus on, oh, let, let's say, systemic uh, racism or socioeconomic injustice? Oh, well, no, that's going to cost them something. So, you know, when the day is all done, it is all about power and hanging on to their power. And so, no, we're not going to see changes very quickly, particularly in some of the largest uh, conservative denominations like the Southern Baptists, uh, because they are still uh, 100% controlled by men. Same thing with the Catholic Church, I think. You talked about, um, you know, the thousands and thousands of people that you lost contact with, or suddenly they were not your friends or acquaintances once you came out. And then, of course, how the church had treated you. Curious, if you had had any responses from, you know, folks from your past since the book has been out, but, you know, your TED Talk has reached over a million views collectively, the, even the one with your son. Yeah, the, uh, and all three of mine together have had over 6 million views. And, um, but nope, no, I, I, I've heard from, since the book came out June 1st, maybe two from my previous world. But all together, I knew thousands of people by name. And I think I were you know, probably around 60 have reached out to me in a nice way at this point, maybe 70. And I've met maybe a dozen and I think two more than once. So no, to that world, I'm pretty much dead. So they're not talking to you. Are they talking about you or have you been disappeared from that universe? No, oh, you can be certain they're talking about me. Um, you, you know, I, I love the work of Edward O. Wilson, the sociobiologist who taught at Harvard and MIT. You know, he identified the nine, what he calls eusocial species, which are um, species that have a tribal gene. So they have the same selfish gene every other species has, but they also have a tribal gene. And he says of these nine species, you know, enemy comes into the, to the camp and the tribe unites, defeats the enemy. Some of the tribe dies, but life goes on. He said, unfortunately, one of the nine new social species has evolved in an odd way, has evolved to believe that an enemy is necessary for the tribe to survive. And where no enemy exists, they create one. And he says, you know, that obviously is us. And if we don't get a hold of that, we lose the species and possibly lose the planet. And, you know, that's the aggravating part of the um, fundamentalist expression of the desert religions is th this is the creation of enemies that do not exist. And, you know, you just wish you could say you don't need an enemy for your community to survive. You went from extremely privileged to, uh, it, it seems like overnight, I mean, you describe it, you know, within seven days, you, or I'm sorry, I think a day you lost. You know, um, yeah, within seven days, I lost everything. Uh, yeah, all my jobs. Yeah. yeah, what was that like, you know, to lose, to go, to, to know that your image, your gender, you as the you know, male presenting was at the very top of the privilege totem pole, and then to lose everything, and then now you are at the bottom. Oh, well, I'm not at the bottom. Well, um, yes, no, no, not. Yeah, not. <laughs> I'm, I'm white, I'm yeah. American. 
And I brought a lot of privilege with me when I transitioned. So I, I'm very aware of my entitlement. You know, I, 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 I come from the borderlands. I, I live in the space between genders, the liminal space between genders. I talked about that with K.K. Otteson at the Washington Post. And um, her, her article was in just a couple of weeks ago. And I've heard from a few trans people kind of, you know, no, we're the same as cisgender women. No, we're not. We've never experienced life in 28 day cycles. So, um, but yes, I did lose tons of privilege and it was devastating and maddening. You know, a woman is not judged in the aggregate body of her work. She's only judged on the, the most recent thing she's accomplished. And generally, she's seen as a, being capable, capable in maybe just one area. So, you know, I was in a board meeting not terribly long after I transitioned, a year or two, of a sizable organization, a, a queer organization. And we had a new CEO and have a big conference. And so we were talking about whether or not to have, the, have her speak for the conference. And I said, well, she's not a, a polished speaker. So maybe just have me interview her. I think that could go well. But if you do want her to speak, I'd be happy to, to, um, to coach her. At which point, a powerful white male in the room, um, actually a McKinsey partner, said, well, if we're going to do that, well, then why don't we hire a real coach? And I waited for someone to speak up and talk about my credentials. I knew I was on that board because I, I used to teach a doctoral course, Current Trends in American Religion. So I, I pretty much understand what's happening in the American church. And so he understood that that was my area of expertise. And what I find now is people assume I can only have one area of expertise. I, you know, I, wanted, I wanted somebody to say what I wanted to say, which is, no, no wait, wait just a minute. Okay, so I've done four TED Talks. I'm a speaker's ambassador for TED, which means I work with TED speakers. I, I've coached TEDx speakers. I've taught speech at two universities in the United States and one in Europe. T tell me what part of that doesn't make me a real coach. But you know, instead, I, I didn't say anything because again, now I'm just that woman. And so, you know, it, that, that is aggravating. I always say when I'm speaking, if there's one single thing guys could do that would make a difference, it would be assume a woman knows what she's talking about and treat her accordingly. That, and stop interrupting us, R really just stop, because men interrupt women twice as often as they interrupt other men. I, I don't have any passion about this, you can tell. Speaking of women, uh, you do talk in the book uh, at length about your, your mother and your, your view of her when you were growing up and what she was going yeah. through and how she, you know, the relationship you had with her. How do you think that affected you? And how do you think your decision to transition might have been different or it would have been different had you had a, a better relationship with your mother? Had you... That's a good question. Um, my mother was far more conservative than my father and never would have even spoken to me as Paula if dad had not pressed the issue. And even then, she started in, and I just said very quickly, Mom, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll leave right away. So if you actually want to see me and ever talk to me again, we're not going to, you're not going to do this. Uh, but she was, unfortunately, um, not a well person with um, major mental health diagnoses. And I look now and realize how tragic her life was, because what happened to her um, might not have happened had it been a different world. She was a brilliant woman with really my personality. So an alpha personality and a public facing personality and grew up in this fundamentalist world where you know, she's supposed to be obedient to her husband. She's not supposed to ever speak to men in front of men as a public speaker. I mean, she was so repressed. And you put that together with what happened to her early in life. And no wonder she was so frightened and terrified of ever really becoming who she was. And so I find it, it is not lost on me that um, 
you know, I'm sure I could find a therapist somewhere who would say, oh, well, that's actually why you transitioned because you, you're trying to live out your mother's uh, unfulfilled life. You know, the, the union analyst, James Hollis, said the most important thing that a parent can do is to live your life as fully as possible so your children don't feel the need to complete the life you never chose for yourself. Um, so, yeah, I'm aware that children do that. Um, that is not why I transitioned. But hey, uh, I'm transgender and I transition, so why not? You know, so I'm always constantly aware that um, I am speaking with my mother's voice that she would have had, had she ever had the freedom to have it. Mm. You know, one of the things I love uh, so much about your memoir, your raw memoir, uh, that it gives me permission to say it's okay to not follow the rules or make your own rules and we are okay. They were probably even better. Uh, I love the story of your grandchildren coming up with a new name for you, Grandpa. And um, and just, you know, and then of course, right? The conversation around a pathway to redemption and what that means to you and your family. And you're all okay. And you're all in 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 in, so, in this way in which because I feel like what society does is use the transgender community as a scapegoat and they always go for the children, the, the children argument, the children would not be okay. Um, and so what I love about your book is that I think it tells us humans that we do not always have to be that obedient or what is society's rules or religion's rules for us to be one way. Yeah, I was, um, I, I've memorized all my talks my whole life. I, I, the process of memorization is, is my editor. You know, if you find something in a talk that you just can't remember, you keep forgetting it, but you keep forgetting it because it was never supposed to be there. It's extraneous to what it is you want to say. So I've always memorized my talks, but for a TED talk, you have to memorize word for word because it's going to be translated into so many languages. And that was different for me. And I kept losing um, my place at one transition point. And, you know, they're, they're heavily vetted and you, you're on, you know, edit 1042 when you finally give a TED talk. And I was fortunate enough at TEDx Mile High, the first one I spoke at, which is one of the largest TEDx's in the world here in Denver, uh, to have the head of coaching for TED, Briar Goldberg, as my coach. And, um, and I kept just losing that spot. And Briar said, what are we going to do? And I said, I need a transition sentence. And she said, well, come up with one and give it to me in the morning. And I'll let you know if it works. And I, it was about two in the morning that I found that sentence. And I gave it to her. And, and she said that, yep, that works. And, um, and I included it in the talk I did with my son at TED Women in 2018. And included it again in my TEDx Mile High talk in 2019 and at the TED Summit, which was not uh, recorded uh, for other TED speakers in 2019. And it is in fact the dedication line of my book. The call toward authenticity is sacred and holy and for the greater good. That I believe with everything in me. Yeah. You had millions of people watch your TED talks You've, of course, written this book and you're, you're talking about it. Clearly, you, you, you talk about this a lot now. I'm going to ask, I guess, a twofold question. One is, do you find it easy to talk about your, your transition? And two, could you kind of take us back to, as, as you relate in the book, what it was like when you were having to go out and, and begin, for example, telling your board and, and, and others at Orchard that you were transitioning, that you were transgender? Yeah, at the time I told all of them, I, I was really so naive. Uh, I, I wasn't sure I was going to transition yet, but I knew it was moving from possibility to probability. And so I felt it only fair to tell them and did not think they would respond as they did. I thought they would, would work with the timeline I had established. Um, 
So I'm not even sure I'm going to transition. And I was very sure they would, you know, there, there was one of two options, really. They could think to themselves uh, on hearing the news, uh, oh, wow, we, we know Paul's character. So apparently we don't know what it means to be transgender um, because certainly Paul's a person of character. And so let's just hear out what this means. Um, their other option was to say, oh, my, we thought we knew Paul's character. Clearly, if Paul, Paul's transgender, we, we did not. We were wrong about Paul's character. I had no idea, no idea that that would be the majority opinion that, I mean, I don't mean just majority, I mean 99% would be, oh, we've been wrong about Paul's character. And that that was devastating. It was really devastating. That a couple of month period was, um, I would say to this point, um, the most difficult in my life. And it was, um, there was, it was not okay. I was not prepared for that. Talking about it is never easy because I don't believe you can talk about it with integrity unless you're willing to be authentic in talking about it. And I also believe people do change their minds on subjects, but not unless information comes to them in a non-threatening way. Debates do nothing. Arguing points does nothing. How does information come to us in a non-threatening way? It's always through narrative, it's through story. More story-based species, you know, sleep without dreaming. We don't dream in mathematical equations, we dream in stories. So I think telling my story is, is how the world hears and sees that, oh, these are relatively normal human beings, as relatively normal as all of us are relatively normal. And you can't do that without being vulnerable. And you can't being, be vulnerable without waking up with a vulnerability hangover occasionally. I'm sorry, I keep giving you long answers, John. Those are great answers. Thank you. And now grief, uh, you know, um, allowing ourselves to grieve. I, I do genuinely feel like as, you know, we're dealing with this pandemic that many of us may be grieving in, in different ways, or it may feel much more heavy than it did a couple years ago. I don't know. But going back to feeling like reading this memoir that I, I can feel okay to not be okay. There was a moment in a relationship with your children after coming out uh, that you talk about in the book that it almost, it almost as if you said that you were trusting the process and you allowed for them to grieve. And in, and in some ways that trust did manifest into a much you know, healthier relationship. So I turn to you again to help us, um, to help us grieve, I guess. We Americans don't know how to grieve. Uh, we have so much privilege that we have come to assume that we deserve happiness. Much of the rest of the world, certainly the developing world, knows that most of life is spent in the swamplands, not on the beach. And so most of the world has learned how to grieve. What we've learned how to do is avoid grieving whether it's through turning over responsibility for ourselves to religious leaders who see everything black and white, or whether it's through numbing our lives through some kind of substance and abusing it, or through running away through just working too hard or becoming obsessed with, with running or mountain biking, both my sports with which I'm obsessed, by the way, I'll admit. Uh, but you know, we, we try to avoid grieving. And I'm going through uh, really significant grief at the moment, probably you know, outside of that time that I, I lost all my jobs, it's probably the worst grief I've ever gone through. And in some ways it's even, even worse than that time frame. And I don't know how to grieve. And part of that is because men aren't taught how to grieve. I was talking to my former wife about this and she said, oh, you always held uh, expected me to hold your emotions for you. You would try to think your way uh, out of opportunities you had to grieve. And, you know, my best friend um, 
the same thing over, over the last couple of years. Uh, if I've needed to grieve, I, I, I expect her to hold my emotions for me. I, I will think my way through it. I, I will just get into my head. And now, uh, for the first time ever in my life, I'm having to feel my emotions of grief. It's not fun. But it's so necessary. And I think all of us who are therapists, and I'm a pastoral counselor, that's what my doctorate is in, um, we see our clients coming in with major PTSD and with what's happened with COVID and is currently happening with COVID, taking them to other past hurts in their lives and not knowing how to mourn or grieve. And my children did it well. And I think that's why. You know, this past summer, well, just a few weeks ago, uh, and it's nine years since, since we told them. It, it was interesting because, uh, because we, we thought naively early on, oh, it would take us five years. And we were saying um, uh, this summer, nope, 10. 10 is about what it's taking us to reach a new normal. We're almost there. That, that's how it felt this year, almost there. And I think with some work my former wife and I are doing, um, there's, there's kind of a, a new covenant of friendship that's developing there because uh, that was hard for her. I mean, if you read the book, you know how much I love and respect her, but you know what I did to her was not fair. Uh, and yeah, um, she's had to grieve that. And I've had to grieve what I did to her. Uh, oh, that was no fault of my own, but nevertheless brought her great pain. And there's a new awareness about that that's just unfolded in the last few days. That is, uh, you know, I'm not sleeping well right now. And, I'm, and I've lost like eight pounds in eight days. Um, it's, it's an important and good and redemptive process. You know, the, the purpose of psychotherapy, or I think religion, um, or spiritual communities, is not to help us avoid the pain of life, but to help us work our way through it. And we're going to have to grieve as a nation for a long time. And I don't know if we have the will to do it. That's a really good question, Michelle. Thank you. We, we talked a bit about this before the program started, and I'm going to ask you kind of the same question, which was, you know, there's the old line about doctors make the worst patients. You're a therapist. You've been to therapists. How are you as a therapist? How are you as the therapy patient? Um, and do you find yourself second guessing your, your therapist or is it actually a boon to the process? No, I've, I've got like the quintessential New York uh, female therapist that I've had since 1993. And she's walking through the current issues I'm dealing with with me. And she's like amazing. And she was uh, she was kind of tough with me last week. Um, you know, I had a, a close friend at literally have to uh like scream at me yesterday. And my former wife had to do that with me uh, about a month ago. Um, and, you know, generally as a therapist, you're not screaming at your <laughs> clients. Um, the, you know, you're more gently trying to get them there. But um, come to think of it, uh, yeah, all of these people were either pastors or therapists who were doing the yelling. Um, there comes a time, you know, when you just have to say, stop, listen. And, um, you know, we can't be our own therapist. No, no, it's a terrible thing to do. And I have needed all of those people to say to me, um, hey, here's what you're doing. The, the only benefit of being a therapist is they can use the technical language and I get it, you know, so it goes a little faster. But no, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm not so good. Scott Peck always used to say that, you know, you're finally ready to leave therapy when you can be your ideal ego observer. 
And I think that's probably true. I think that you get to the point where you can, in a lot of ways, do therapy on yourself. But then there will always be those areas to which you are just blind. And you're always going to need that person on the outside who either gently takes you through it or, you know, wakes you up by, by screaming at you um, because you're just not going to see it if you're just, you know, sitting inside your head. Well, I'm sure of it that uh, your videos, your talks, your book has impacted, affected, has been therapeutic for many people out there. I asked earlier if you had gotten any responses from your your past community, the evangelical community, but I think it would be a, a great note to wind down and talk about the many people that have written to you or many uh, people have reached out to you and have loved your story. Yeah. Yeah, it's not necessarily a story of uh, transitioning genders. It's a story of answering the call of the hero's journey. And, you know, we're all terrified to do that because it's always under the road of trials and nobody willingly goes under the road of trials. You know, we, we don't do that. And then once you get on the road of trials, you find yourself in this deep, dark cave, invariably, on the hero's journey. And, and you know, you've, you're totally lost, but only then do you realize that lost is a place too? you know? I mean, I think it's what Dante was talking about at the beginning of Divine Comedy when he said, in the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood where the true way was wholly lost. You just have to spend time there. And that's who I'm hearing from, people who are currently in the place called lost. And they're just looking for a light at the end of the tunnel that is not an oncoming train. And I'm shedding just enough light to take them one step further along on that journey. Well, that's worth it. Yeah, that's what you write a book for. That's what you bury your soul for. Because, uh, you know, I depend on the people a step or two in front of me. And, um, and I want to be there for those who are a step in or two behind. Yeah. I know you've just got the book out and you're still talking about it, but um, do you see another book coming? And if so, do you kind of know what you'd want to tackle in it? You know, two chapters of this book are about uh, gender inequity and two chapters are about uh, religious intolerance. Um, there are plenty of people writing good books on gender inequity. I think I've said, you know, my unique perspective, having lived life on both sides. Um, I think I would be inclined to write about why religion is behaving the way it behaves. I think Jonathan Haidt's book, uh, The Righteous Mind, is an amazing book in, in helping us understand why we as humans behave the way we behave. And I, I think I th that would be, um, I think the, the next book would be on helping people who are not a part of a religious world, which is an increasing segment of our population. You know, 70% of America was a part of some local religious affiliation as, as recently as 1997, and we're down to, to 47% now. So that's been a 23% drop in, in just really 20 years, 24 years. Um, so a lot of those people do not understand what's going on. And I think that's probably what I would write about, yeah. We'll be the first to get our copy. Dr. Paula Stone Williams, thank you so much for sharing your afternoon with us. And thank you for your book, As a Woman. And so if you don't have your copy, please go out and get it. Um, it's a very, very, very important book and you need it on your shelves. And thank you for joining us, John. Thanks again to our special guest on this Michelle Miao show from the Commonwealth Club of California. Thanks to all of you for watching or listening online. You can find more programs, remember, at commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. Stay safe and have a good weekend. Bye.